influence, to make treaties with the next door neighbors, to make sure that my people can live in peace, to make sure that prosperity start to reign among where I rule. And if we all have that attitude, then I believe we can achieve something, not for ourselves, but for the people that God created, that we can influence their life. So our motive and objective of gaining knowledge and wisdom should always be for the benefit of God's creation. And I pray, Professor Dunga, that you will apply that to your life, that what you've gained and the knowledge and wisdom that you've gathered, that it will be a benefit to the people around you, to the country, and to the world, because then we can make a difference. And I believe that's why God placed us on the earth, to make a difference to what we have gathered and the ability and the gifts he has given us to put that back to him to say, Lord, use me to be a benefit to the people of God. Amen. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, as we come this afternoon with this wonderful occasion, we are so thankful, Lord, that you've given Professor Dunga the ability to come to where he is today, the wisdom and the knowledge he has gathered. May you help him, Father, to from this point forward as well, to grow in it, that it will be a benefit, Father, to the community, to the university, to the people of South Africa and to the world, Lord, that some way something will come out of it to help the people. Father, we commit the rest of the proceedings into thy hands. We pray that you will bless us of your presence and that it will be at the end of the day that we will say it was wonderful. And we want to thank thee for every good, good gift, for all the knowledge that we can gather and the wisdom that we want to apply to bring honor to thy great kingdom as we yield it now to thee in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Herman van der Merwe, and I'm the Deputy Dean responsible for teaching and learning in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. And it's going to be my privilege this afternoon to welcome you all and make you feel welcome as well. A very specific word of welcome to Prof. Linda Duplessis our Vice Principal and the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Planning and Campus Operations on the Van der Belt Park campus. Professor Ntebo Moroke, she's online and um, she's our Acting Executive Dean. Prof. Bab Surujal, the Deputy Dean of Research and Innovation. Prof. Dan Metzeling is also online He's the Acting Deputy Dean for Community Engagement on the Mahikin campus. Professor Weinand Grobler, our Academic Director in the School of Economic Sciences. Professor Andre Heymans, the Deputy Director in the School of Economic Sciences on the Pochus Groom campus. And then Pro Professor Teboho Mosikari, who's also online and the Acting Deputy Director of the School of Economic Sciences on Mahikin. Also a hearty word of welcome to Pastor Hannes van Wyk, who opened this event for us and shared some wisdom from the word. And then all our colleagues from the School of Economic Sciences on all three of our campuses, those who are watching us, who are here um, uh, on, on the, via the internet, and um, of course our bigger Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences family, as well as colleagues from the Van Abel Park campus. Talking about the internet, uh, uh, I'm going to continue with the welcome now. I know that, uh, that there is load shedding in the area, so uh, we do record everything. So for those people online, if the signal do drop, uh, the, the, the video will be uploaded later on. 
So apologies for that, but we're trying our utmost best. I know that they're standing everywhere trying to keep the signal up, so let's, let's hope that, uh, that it's there. But friends, I particularly want to welcome Prof. Steve Dunga's parents, who are virtually here. Uh, they are supporting him online in Malawi and uh, are currently really engaged in what is happening here. But then a big surprise for Steve Dunga's elder brother, Daniel, and his wife Susan, who came all the way from Malawi to come and surprise and support him. I unfortunately missed that part when he fell down when he saw his brother. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> but last, but not definitely not least, all of his family and friends here present and also those watching the live stream in Malawi and elsewhere in the world. That is so wonderful that we can have our colleagues and friends everywhere in the world looking into what is happening here tonight. And uh, that is wonderful. Colleagues, friends, the Northwest University in the recognition of excellence and exceptional academic leadership confers the bearers of these qualities. That is the highest academic title, the title of professor. Now, a Northwest University professorship doesn't come cheap. It comes with a stringent set of requirements and responsibilities. For instance, it is expected of a professor, and I just picked a few, to be the intellectual leader in the subject field, to be recognized by the colleagues and the industry as a leader in the field, to be extensively involved in sharing their knowledge with their peers and with industry. So not keeping everything to yourself. No to initiate and create research opportunities and guide and supervise students, to train and encourage other staff members, and to act as a role model for their juniors and students. Obviously, to make a substantial contribution to the effective management and functioning of the school and the faculty, and of course, being an outstanding lecturer or teacher. So, Professor Dunga, as you all can imagine, complied with all these criteria as set by the university for excellence and exceptional academic leadership. That's why we're here today. And that's why we are going to listen to his inaugural lecture. But the inaugural address is an opportunity for the newly promoted professor to inform colleagues, peers, and the general public about their research career and update us on their current and future research directed directions. And it really marks the pinnacle of the professor's intellectual pursuit. An inaugural address also represents an essential component of the university's public events program, helping to create a broader awareness of the latest developments in research in the faculty and in the university. The Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences are privileged to have seven staff members presenting inaugural addresses this year in various disciplines. Prof. Steve, tonight you can celebrate this important personal milestone with your family, your friends and your colleagues. As we all know, poverty is one of our biggest challenges. And maybe I can share with you that I had the privilege to read the paper so I have some inside information, but nonetheless, I look forward to your presentation and the road that you'll pay for us towards achieving the maximum social benefit in South Africa and globally. And as Pastor Van Weyck said, making things better, as pointed out in Proverbs. Colleagues, friends, I now request Pro Weinand Grobler the Academic Director of the School of Economic Sciences, to please introduce Professor Steve Dunga to us. Thanks. Good 
Deputy Vice Chancellor, Executive Dean uh, of the Faculty of Economics and Management Sciences, Deputy Deans, Directors, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Stephen Dunga. Now, Stephen Dunga was born in Malawi on the 11th of February 1980 to Pastor Henry Dunga and his wife Elizabeth Dunga. Steve is married also to Dr. Hannah Dunga and they have two children, Samantha and Adonai. And Steve is also a, denote, a devoted Christian at the country Tabernacle. Steve went to several schools in Malawi and graduated with his first degree from the University of Malawi in 2004. He then worked for the Ministry of Trade and Private Sector Development in Malawi for uh, close to a year before he rejoined the University of Malawi as a junior lecturer and starting his academic career. He studied further towards a master's degree at the University of London in 2007, where he graduated then in 2008. And between 2008 and 2012, he did further studies at IIEP based in France, Ruhr University in Bochum, Germany, the University of Western Cape, and Dubai University of Economics and Business in China. Steve came then to uh, the Northwest University in a role for his PhD and graduated with a PhD in economics in 2014, where he was also awarded a certificate of merit as the best PhD student in 2013 in economics, and that was awarded by the Economics Research Southern Africa. In 2014, Steve joined the Northwest University then as a full-time uh, academic, as lecturer, and was promoted to associate professor in 2017 and full professor in 2021. In his academic career, he has published numerous journal articles in peer-reviewed accredited journals, both locally and internationally, on the field that the inaugural address will be on, and has presented a number of conference papers, both locally and internationally. Steve uh, can be considered as a well-rounded academic, and he is currently the acting deputy director of the School of Economic Sciences on the Von Abel Park campus. It is a great pleasure then for me to introduce Prof. Steve Dunga, who is also a fellow academic, and we have done so many work together, so it's really a great pleasure for me. And his inaugural speech will be on the topic, the nexus of poverty and housing insecurity, developing a household housing insecurity index, a very important topic, and I think it will be a very um, uh, interesting uh, inaugural speech. Welcome, Prof. Steve Dunga. Madam Deputy Vice Chancellor, Prof. Linda Duplessis, Pastor Hannes Van Peck, who prayed for us this afternoon, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences who's watching us online, Prof. Debo Moroke, the Deputy Dean of Teaching and Learning, Prof. Henman van der Merve, the Deputy Dean Research and Innovation, Prof. Bob Surjo, the Director of the School of Economic Ma uh, Sciences, Prof. Vendan Frobler, distinguished professors, members of the Investor Management Committee who are watching us online and even here present, academic and then academic colleagues, distinguished guests, family members, 
my brother, <laughs> Daniel, who has surprised me today. That was not a good idea. <laughs> it was, it's shaken me. I was, I was comfortable. <laughs> now I have to gather myself again. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is a great honor for me, and I feel humbled that you have made time in your busy sages to come on this occasion of my inaugural address in recognition of my promotion to Professor of Economics. It is a great privilege for me to share with you my academic journey in research to this day. I would like to thank the Almighty God for the gift of life, especially now in these difficult times where each day is a blessing. I am very grateful to my parents who may be watching us now for their support and the character they imparted in me throughout my life. A special appreciation to my wife, uh, Dr. Hannah Dunga, uh, my children, Samantha and Adonai, and numerous friends uh, present here that I cannot mention one by one. You all have made a big contribution to my journey to this day. Provenant, I want to mention you uh, sp specifically because you have been my mentor in this journey, and I'm really grateful. Madam DVC, uh, I will try and give a synopsis of my research journey in this presentation, mainly focusing on the past five years. I have titled uh, the speech or the talk, the nexus of poverty and housing insecurity, developing a household housing insecurity index, the HHII, in short, introducing the HHII. So you see uh, in the slide there that I will try as much as possible literature review in the paper that is in the program. Then I'll introduce the nexus of housing insecurity and poverty, what I call the multiple heads metaphor. This will be linked to a case for a unified measure of housing insecurity. Then the proposed measure of housing insecurity, which will be followed by a brief on policy implications where I make an argument for maximum social benefit emanating from efficient production and consumption of housing as a mixed good. All right, so in 2017, when Donald Trump was elected as president of the United States of America, he chose his rival, uh, Ben Carson, as a secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, known as HUD. And in his presentation to the Senate, which is a requirement in the United States before one is confirmed as minister or secretary in their case, he said, and I quote, after moving in with relatives, I understood what housing insecurity is all about, end of, end of quote. So the phrase housing insecurity sparked a lot of interest in me as we were busy with poverty research and we had not tackled housing insecurity at that point. Now as a researcher of poverty, I was taken back to think about what I understood about housing insecurity. Because within his presentation, he Dr. Ben Carson made a link between housing insecurity and poverty, housing insecurity and health, housing insecurity and crime, et cetera. And I thought, we must know. We must be writing on this. So this ignited a lot of interest in me. And in 2017, we published the first paper on housing insecurity, which we titled The Nexus of Food and Housing Insecurity in South Africa, a case of Bopilong and Sharpeville Township which I co-authored with Provenant, and another paper which we titled Determinants of Housing Insecurity in a Low-Income South African Township, which I co-authored with Dr. Precious Ngai, 
And in both these two papers, one thing was clear. There was no unified measure of housing insecurity. Because all we wanted to do, just like what we do in economics, is find a measure that exists and apply it in whatever it is that we're doing. So because we were focusing on poverty and we found this gap, it created a lot of interest in that area. So we are looking at housing insecurity in the wider context of poverty. So I want to paint uh, a picture of poverty. So the global economy continuously revises its priorities as new one keeps on emerging. A few years ago, COVID-19 was not one of the priorities. Now, you and I can agree that COVID and vaccines have taken priority. However, you will know that poverty remains one of the most important challenges decades after it was recognized as a, a global problem. The Sustainable Development Goals, which are shown there, there's 17 of them, recognizes poverty as the most important issue for global development, and it is goal number one. And poverty is also featured among top challenges of the 21st century, which include issues such as ecological collapse, climate change, war, chemicals in the environment, food shortage, diseases, and delusion of thinking. Those are some of the challenges in the 21st century, and poverty is one of them, still featuring. No one knows the actual picture of poverty. Uh, this is because since COVID-19, a lot of things have happened, and there hasn't been data collected. All the data that we have is what is now termed as the BC data, which is now before COVID, <laughs> not before Christ. So before the COVID pandemic, uh, more than 700 million people were living below the $1.9 per day globally. And that is a weak measure. When uh, the multidimensional measure of poverty is used, 1.3 billion people are considered to be living in poverty. When you bring it home here to South Africa, a recently published report by Stats SA on child poverty indicates that 61.2% of children between the age of 0 and 17 are multidimensionally poor. Now, children do not exist in isolation, they exist in households. So basically, this picture is basically telling us that 61.2% of households in South Africa are multidimensionally poor. So both the global picture, the national picture, the regional picture, is showing us that poverty is not a problem that is going away. It is actually getting worse. If you read reports by World Bank, they will show you that only China gained in reducing poverty. Sub-Saharan Africa was busy getting worse and worse. The numbers were getting worse and worse. Robert Walker, a renowned professor of social policy at the University of Oxford said, Poverty persists because we have misdiagnosed it. We have failed to properly conceptualize it, and hence we are failing to deal with it. So I make a case in this presentation that one of the missing components leading to this mi misdiagnosis of poverty is the housing insecurity component, and I'll show it in the presentation. So poverty is many things. As you can see in that slide, one of the issues that stands out as poverty is being discussed is housing insecurity here captured in its severe state of homelessness. So when discussions are done around poverty, poverty itself, itself stands first. And then next is poor, which is poverty, just stated in a different way. And then homelessness, which talks about housing. The UNDP working with Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, or PHI, have made a significant attempt 
and bringing a better picture of poverty in their multidimension poverty index or the MPI. So you will note that in the MPI, which is presented in this slide, poverty is no longer an income line. Poverty is no longer one dollar, one comma nine dollars a day, but a more complex issue with multiple dimensions. In the MPI, housing is also recognized. However, as a small leg within the standard of living. This is also a big misdiagnosis. You have a leg, you have got a head being considered or being looked at as a leg, or as Reverend Branham would say, you have a cow eating grass on top of a tree. It's a messed up picture. In their MPI, the UNDP, this is now global leaders in this research, consider poverty to have three heads, all right? And of those three heads, housing is not one of them. Housing is a leg on the standard of living. Now, I wanna make you just look at it and think about it. In your household, what takes most of your income? Food. I don't think so. Uh, healthcare is the bond, isn't it? The, the bond takes the, sh the biggest chunk of your income. <laughs> the Maslow hierarchy of needs will tell you that food, shelter, which is housing, and maybe clothing, uh, the top most things. How then are the global leaders taking this most important thing and throwing it as if it's an option on your budget? So the next slide, before you go to it. Oh, it's there already. <laughs> My wife told me that is scary. I shouldn't use it. But I, I, I felt it, it helps me make the point. I first used this metaphor, I think, in 2017, where we describe poverty as an animal with multiple heads. We argue that it is impossible to deal with this animal called poverty by looking at one head at a time. All the different life-giving heads must be severed simultaneously. If you can't say one head and leave one head, after a short time, the head that you thought you defeated will reappear. If you deal with food security and housing security still exist, you will find that after some time, the existence of housing and security will erode the gains you made in food security. I'll give you a, a practical example. Here in South Africa, there are studies that have shown that there are people with two to three Arab DP houses, and they are still living in a shack. And in one of the studies, uh, they ask these people, you have got two RITP houses. Why are you living, still living in a shack? They said, because we need money to buy food and to buy clothes. So we're, we're renting out the RITP houses, and then we get the money to buy food. It's a clear indication that the government intervention only dealt with one head, and the other heads are so powerful that the gains made on that particular head are taken away. So studies done by with the poor themselves identify important heads of this poverty animal. And the description or the definition of poverty coming from these poor people is a more reliable definition as opposed to the poverty line determined by UNDP or World Bank. So when poor people are asked in participatory studies what makes them feel poor, they indicate a wide range of deprivations. Not having enough to eat, having inadequate housing, being sick, having limited or no formal education, having no work, and living in unsafe neighborhoods, according to World Bank uh, Report of 2020 on page 43. So that's the definition of poverty from the poor. So we can say, 
that poverty, based on definition from the poor, is an animal with multiple heads. And these heads are food insecurity, housing insecurity, health, literacy, employment or unemployment, and sanitation. And these are also identified by the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the global agenda. The global economy is guided by those seven goals, uh, those 17 goals known as the Sustainable Development Goals. So you will note that the first head is identified as goal number two. And the head of uh, health is also identified as goal number three. All the heads that the poor themselves have identified are also included in the Sustainable Development Goals. But there's one head, which is supposed to be number two, housing insecurity. It's goal number one in the Sustainable Development Goals. Does not exist. Why? To show that the global leaders knew the importance of housing, but they did not know how to include it in the sustainable development because I will tell you why. I suspect because all the goals included in the sustainable development goals were benchmarked. This is where we are and this is where we want to be. You can only do that if you are able to measure the goal. Now housing was all over the place. They did not have a clear measure. They did not know how to benchmark it and then they went on and hide it under goal number 11. So if you go inside goal number 11, sustainable goal number 11, target number one, if you go to the next side, you'll find that to sh uh, they say by 2030, we ensure access for all to adequate, safe, affordable housing and basic services and also upgrade slums. What does that mean? H how is adequate going to be measured? What is adequate housing? How are they going to quantify safe housing? What do they mean by upgrade slums? To what? We, are, we upgrade slums to... to <laughs> so this was a clear hassle. The housing was a big hassle. If you go now, in the sustainable goal number 11 and check the progress, you find that it's unclear because there does not exist a clear measure of what they're talking about. We go to the next slide. So although there is still no clear consensus on the unified conceptualization of housing and security, there is considerable agreement, considerable convergence in the understanding of the working definition and hence moving towards a unified conceptualization of what it entails. We, as well as many other researchers, saw this gap in the literature. And there has been a, a growing literature in the last few years. It was like a marathon of who is going to cover it first. Others call this human settlement. Others call it housing security. But we documented in our, in our paper of 2017 and another one in 2019 that housing insecurity should be defined as a state in which a household does not have secure, stable, and affordable housing, and in its severe state, a state of homelessness. Other studies have identified or defined housing more broadly to mean all aspects that threaten stability. For example, the Department of Health and Human Services has defined housing insecurity as high housing costs in proportion to the household income. or poor housing quality, or unstable neighborhoods. So the literature even attempted to quantify the seriousness of housing insecurity. In 2015, 1.5 billion people in the world were living in inadequate and unsafe housing, according to the UN Habitat. And the UN Habitat also in 2016 reported that 100 million people become homeless every day. Now, think about it. Every single day, 100 million people become homeless. How, why is that the case? I suspect that because homelessness 
is a severe state, the final point, and because you're not able to see this coming, you only identify it when it hits you. That's why you have 100 million people becoming homeless every day. The next slide. Thus the seriousness of housing insecurity is greater than perceived. Its contribution to poverty is underestimated and even its importance greater than the attention being given so far, both nationally and globally. Allow me for the next two slides to give you a bit of literature on the definitions and the measures in the literature that, gives the, that informs the development of the uh, HHI. We all know that uh, credible proposals has to have its foundation in literature. We don't have to just dream it up. So Cox, in 2017, defined housing security as limited or uncertain, and you will see the words that are marked, highlighted, are what I'm picking to build into the case of the HHI. So limited and uncertain availability of stable, safe, adequate, and affordable housing and neighborhoods, or the inability to acquire stable, safe, adequate, and affordable housing. You will see that this agrees with sustainable goal number 11, uh, target 11.1. Uh, Johnson and Friend pointed out that housing insecurity should be perceived as a wide-ranging extent of perilous and dangerous housing situations, which may involve being homeless, living in overcrowded hom homes, or unsafe homes, and situated in unstable neighborhoods. Uh, Gayla and uh, Curtis pointed out that even households that are burdened by, how, uh, by high housing costs, such as rent, in proportion to their income, are regarded as experiencing housing insecurity, since their continued residence is threatened by the high probability of eviction. So you, uh, someone can be living in a beautiful house, a double story. And, and they are going towards insecurity. You've seen stories of people uh, in most of these developed countries that are homeless, and when you ask them, they'll tell you, I, I used to be a bank manager. I used to be uh, a fund manager, and, and I was driving, but now uh, I don't even have a house. Wong, Elliot, Reed, and Ross defined housing insecurity as the absence of a settled, steady, and adequate nighttime home or sharing housing with others because of loss of previous shelter. So just like poverty, housing insecurity is multidimensional. It's a multidimensional concept which concerns more than just providing shelter. Hartman argues that housing is considered adequate if it is secure, affordable, and habitable, all right? So it is clear that the literature is almost in agreement as to what housing insecurity entails. Thus, the conceptualization is almost achieved. Once one puts these uh, together, and it is almost agreed upon and in agreement with sustainable goal number 11, target 11.1, there is, however, still a gap. There is no unified measure that can be used to measure the seemingly agreed upon concept. So the empirical literature shows a wide range of measures being used in measuring house, housing insecurity because there's no single unified measure. Anyone who wants to measure housing uses whatever it is that comes to their mind. Some uses income. Others use stability. How many times have you moved homes? Others use the l amount of people, the number of people in the household known as crowding, and so on. I've listed the different measures there. And some of these people are UNDP. Some of these studies are done by UNDP, United Nations Development Program, the OPHI, STATS-SA. STATS-SA uses the material used 
on the house. If you say, my house is made of brick, they say, you're secure. <laughs> and they come to that house, they find there's 17 of you living in one room, which is leaking. But because they just ask you, what's the material of your house? And you say, brick, and they are that. <laughs> Do you own the house? Where is the house sitting? When did you move to that house? How many times have you moved from houses? All those things are ignored. And we're using that as a measure of housing security. UNDP2, together with the OPHI, Oxford group, they only using the material. Because it's easy, and easy to ask that question, and there's no alternative. So the literature is clear on the absence of the unified measure of housing and security. So the next step was very clear for us. I don't want to say for me, because that sounds as if I'm working by myself. But we, we work with people. So there's so many of us uh, collaborating. So it was clear for us to fill this gap. The conceptualization was not difficult, as most studies closely agreed on the housing insecurity, that it is not a dichotomous phenomenon. Most studies also agree that homelessness was the extreme position. So therefore, an agreed upon conceptualization is that housing insecurity lays on a continuum. I argue that housing insecurity should be considered as a continuum, thus it is not at all a dichotomous const construct with the presence or absence of security. But, uh, and no, no, is it a binary choice where you say, yes, I'm secure, or no, I'm not secure, but it, it lays on a continuum where you move from a state of security, slowly gliding down without knowing because the measure does not exist. By the time you hit homelessness, you have passed so many stages. All right. So the development of a housing insecurity index needs to recognize the fact that housing is not a house. It is a multifaceted construct that goes beyond having a structure or not having one. Although it is much as, uh, manifested as a physical structure, its insecurity requires considering a number of factors. Thus, we propose a range of components that need to be considered and how much they should weigh in the index calculation. So here, I propose and introduce the multidimensional measure of household housing insecurity, the HHII. It is the argument made here now in this presentation that housing insecurity should be understood and therefore measured using these proposed eight dimensions as informed by the literature. Household income, crowding, or the number of people, or the uh, space available to a person, ownership, material used, stability of the household, security of, and of the neighborhood, facilities and the quality of the amenities available, and family demographics or the dependency ratio. We feel that these eight components captures almost everything that would be considered important in measuring this housing insecurity. So I, I, I will venture now to explain briefly how each of these components is going to be used, calculated, and included in the index. I start with income. Income of a household is important in determining the housing insecurity of a household. The fact that different households may require different sizes and quality of housing makes income important, as it shows the vulnerability of the household by showing the household's ability or inability to afford the housing they choose to occupy. Thus, the percentage of income spent on housing will be considered. Basically, anything above 30% of the household's total income should start to indicate vulnerability of the household. We propose a score ranging from 1 to 10, where 1 is someone owning the house, so you've finished paying. It's yours. There's, there's no percentage of your income going to the household besides maintenance. So it's almost impossible to have 0% going to income, because even if you own the household, you'll be spending 2% for maintenance, 
changing valves, changing the pipes that are bursting every time, and so on. Or if you don't do that, the house that you own will not exist after a few years. So the score between two and nine will be mathematically determined to, present, to represent a percentage between one and 50% of income. Any, so a 10 represent 50% of income going to housing. Anything above 50%, we think it's just a clear problem. So when you add 50, you add a maximum problem in terms of income contribution. When you're 60, worse, but you still score a 10. When you're 70, bad, but you still score a 10 because 10 is the worst point, and we think it starts at point of 50. The second component is crowding, which has also been used in the literature by other studies. The size of the house divided by the number of people in the house will give us the amount of space available to an individual in the household. Although intra-household share of space may not be equal, we assume in this calculation that potentially it is equal because we, we feel that if, if we're going to also look at uh, equivalent scales and uh, intra-household uh, distribution of space, then it will complicate the measure. We know parents take the biggest space, but we assume that there is equal availability of space. That's a specific square metrage per person will be specified where anything less than that will indicate crowding. And a mathematically calculated score will be arrived at, uh, arrived at based on the metrage and the area uh, that the house is located. I believe that uh, the availability of space and the metrage will vary uh, if you are in Fundabil Park or in Jobic Central. We, we cannot say it should be the same because space uh, the value of space varies depending on the where you are, and because we want, we th we believe that can this can be applied anywhere. Then the metrage in New York, for example, the specification will be smaller than, for example, metrage in uh, Mpumalang. The third component is ownership of the structure. The ownership of the structure and the land it stands on may be taken for granted in countries where property ownership laws are clear. But countries where there are high numbers of people in, in informal settlements, this may have serious implications in scoring the ownership component of the index. It may also signal insecurity since the owners of the structure may not have guarantee of not being pushed out by the red ants if they are occupying the land they do not own. If you check Stats SA uh, uh, reports, it shows 88% of, uh, of South Africans indicating that they own the house they live in. If you go a step further, who are these 88%? It's people that own their sharks. So if one builds a shark by anywhere, you come and ask them, who is this house? So it's mine. And then on paper, we indicate 88% of our people have good houses. So that is important because the ownership component could be true, they really own it, but then because the index measures other things, what's the material of the structure? Who owns the land? What's the square metrage of the, of the structure? And so on, those other components will capture that, oh, this is actually just a shark that uh, the person is talking about. The fourth component is the widely used one, the material used for the structure. And this will also be used and will be calculated and a score will be given. And you can see that this one does not need a lot of justification because uh, Stas Etse already uses it. Uh, MPI uh, by the Oxford group also already uses it. But we think it's just a component of the index. And then material used in the construction of the house is relevant especially for a house in informal settlements where there are no structural requirements or certification. Hence, we also develop a score from one to 10 uh, that will indicate a structure miss certification, you get a one, and the shark will get a 10. The fifth component, uh, so we can just go to the next slide. The fifth component is the stability of the household. This is captured by how many times a household has moved or changed houses in the last 24 months. 
This could be due to eviction or failure to afford rentals or mortgage. In the case where household has moved more than two times, it should start I I indicating the vulnerability of the household to insecurity. And we want to take the actual number of movements as a score that will be also weighted and entered in the score. I'm almost done, ladies and gentlemen. Please smile a little bit. <laughs> the sixth component is uh, the house, uh, the neighborhood in which the st household stands in. So households should be able to, to, to score the uh, neighborhood and security of the neighborhood. And uh, we have also a scale of one to 10 where one indicates high level of safety and security from crime, noise, break-ins, and 10 indicate a high risk of noise, crime, and break-ins, and so on. A, a pollution score will also be included. Uh, it, it's going to be, uh, at this point, a, a subjective score. And I think it will be very high in places like Vanderbilt Park and Secunda, where pollution can be smelled, can be felt, can be seen on top of your, of your swimming pool. So that should get a score. The seventh component, last but one, John, is facilities and amenities available in the house. This section in the questionnaire will cover will have a list of amenities and facilities that the household is supposed to have. And the scoring of it is that the number that you do not have will make the score. And we think anything about 10 is enough, even if you have 15 missing. Uh, we take the score of 10 and weigh it and put include it in the index. And the last one, ladies and gentlemen, is a dependency ratio, or known as family demographics, in, in uh, an eminent presenter in Malawi was also presenting on this, they call it black tax sometimes, where, uh, and that eminent pr presenter is my brother. <laughs> so biased. Uh, so the, you will see that you can have your house and your children, but that money is not only for you. So the exposure to change should be given an, a subjective score. We can come and say, okay, how many people are in this house that you say 400, and then you score nicely on the crowding, but we need this to capture that this may change tomorrow, where after two days, a brother, a cousin, a son of a brother, a son of a brother's friend comes <laughs> to live with you. And, and the, the school, so we want to capture, we, we, we cannot uh, ignore that it's a very important component in affecting family dynamics. So the calculation of the HHII is basically now the product of the, uh, the component multiplied by the assigned weight of the component divided by the sum of the uh, weights. As simple as that. <laughs> so, so basically, we're not just gonna take all the components and say, this is the total score. Each and every component should be weighed. How much weight should we give to income? How much weight should we give to uh, crowding? How much weight should we give to material? used for the construction of the house and so on. And then when you collect data and then you just throw them in this formula, then it will give you a one a figure that tells you whether this household is secure or not secure. And if this is a continuum of one to 10, the HHII, then a household that scores one is close to secure. And then a higher score indicates insecurity, a 10, in indicates homelessness. So the MPI or STAS SA should be able to say 80% of our population are on the score of five and below, which is not a risky, a risky position. And then you should be able to say 50% are between five and 10 or above eight, which indicates that there's a great risk of insecurity. You don't want to capture it when people are homeless. Should be able to have a, what do you call that, a pen, just like your, your fuel gauge. It doesn't just tell you it's empty. 
you know that okay, I'm I'm caught a tank now. This is dangerous. I can I can't pass this gas station. I need to fill the tank. That's what that's what we're proposing. And uh, in the actual paper, you can go to the final slide. In the final in the actual paper, I've I've put in more description, more explanation. But I thought the the audience that we have it would be nice uh, to to not include too much. Uh, 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 calculations and so on. So the need to have a clear measure for housing insecurity cannot be overemphasized. The need to have research that can drive policy beyond the theoretical understanding uh, and uh, economic jargon is also clear. So we've done the first round of testing in 10 townships in South Africa. We have partners in India that we're working, one of them reviewed the paper that are willing to also test the index in India. The, the UNDP and the Oxford group were presenting their updated report of the MPI on the 7th of October, and I attended that one online, and I wrote to them, I said, you have a head being looked at as a leg. This is a mistake, this is a misdiagnosis, and we have developed a solution to that the HHII, and then they responded to me and said, okay, please share the link of the paper that you've done and we wanna take a look at it. And we're going to share it with them. Uh, I'm sure that there's gonna be improvements. Obviously, this is the, the, the starting point of the HHII, but it covers a, a gap that does not only exist nationally, but globally, the, this gap existed. And this is, we believe, a, a very good step in, in covering that gap. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Dunga, congratulations on an excellent, on an excellent and thought-provoking uh, inaugural lecture. I think it was a month or two ago when uh, Professor Dunga and I ran into one another on the campus, and he was walking from venue to venue, finding the ideal spot for his inaugural lecture. And uh, we were contemplating the weather and should we have it at Building Six and down here. But but I think looking now, this was perfect, uh, and it. Really, uh, this whole occasion um, do justice to, to your lecture. It was uh, Albert Georgie that said, research is seeing what everybody else has seen and thinking what nobody else has thought. And we really had some thought-provoking ideas about um, Household Security Index tonight. But uh, Professor Dunga, you have reached a huge milestone at a very early age in your life. Um, and it's clear that you know where you are going. Uh, ultimately, every individual must define what success will look like for himself or herself. But uh, when Pastor Aranis, uh started this evening and he said, welcome to the inaugural lecture of our Professor Dunga, I thought, well, that word, our, says it all. Um, it's a great testimony for the faculty that you started as a PhD student, your journey with us as a lecturer and a... Uh, that you are now flourishing as a researcher. Uh, congrat <coughs> congratulations. Now, all universities have their ups and downs and sometimes they perform a better. Um, the Northeast University has really performed very well on numerous scales lately, but we are only performing well because the people at the university are performing so well. People respect the university because of the work that we're doing. People take us seriously because of the quality of the work of our researchers. So Professor Dunga, when you become a full professor, it's not only a change in Peromna's level, as Prof. Herman has alluded. A full professor has a very important role to play in your discipline and in your faculty. And I just want to mention three of them. Our professors become the conscience of the faculties because it's your responsibility to ensure that research is conducted with the highest ethical standards, and also that research are used 
to solve global problems in a local context. Our professors become the strength of the faculty because it's through research that you can push the boundaries of knowledge. But our professors also become the enthusiasm in the faculty because you become a role model and you inspire and you motivate other people. I hope that a few years from now, we will attend another inaugural lecture and it will be somebody that says, my mentor was Professor Dunga, like you could testify tonight about Professor Weinand. So with these few words on behalf of the management of the university, our heartfelt congratulations on your promotion to full professor and with your inaugural address tonight. Be sure that you are now on our radar and we are really watching your future career and achievements with great anticipation. And I hope it will be at the Northwest University, also your alma mater. We wish you all of the best. It, it is uh, now my privilege to hand a certificate and a handmade gift as a remembrance of this evening to Professor Dunga. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening to you. I've been entrusted with the easiest and most pleasurable task this afternoon, and that is to extend a vote of thanks on behalf of Professor Dunga. Before I extend the thanks, I want to congratulate Professor Dunga on this excellent milestone that he has reached in his life. I, I have followed his uh, research journey all the way, and I know the amount of hard work that he has put into reaching this stage. So, Prof. Dunga, everything of the best for the future from now on. So, on uh, behalf of uh, Prof. Dunga, I would like to thank the members of the academic uh, procession, Professor Linda Duplessis, the Deputy Vice Chancellor on the Vanderbilt Park campus, Professor Herman van der Merwe, Deputy Dean, Teaching and Learning, Professor Bab Surujlal, that's me, uh, <laughs> Deputy Dean, uh, Research and Innovation, uh, Professor Venan Krobler, the uh, Director in the School of Economic and Management Sciences, and Professor Andre Heymans, the Deputy Director, uh, School of uh, Economic and Management Sciences. A special word of thanks to uh, Pastor Hannes van Weyck, for the spiritual uh, support and guidance and for opening the function with a word of prayer. Professor Dunga would also like to thank uh, his wife. His, in, in fact, he said, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Hannah Dunga, his wife and companion for almost 14 years for her encouragement and support. He also thanks his children, Samantha and Adonai, as well as his parents, Pastor Dunga and mother, Mrs. Dunga, for their unwavering support throughout his life. Professor Dunga would personally like to thank those who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this function the success it was. And the people he wants to thank are Esme Labuskakni, Nombulelo Gumeda, Hele Uesta, Rihanna Prinslu, and Lee Nell. And of course, uh, although he didn't say this, and I know he meant this, 
Professor Dunga would like to thank his brother for the pleasant surprise of attending the inaugural lecture in person. Finally, a deep sense of appreciation is extended to all of you who made the time to attend this function in person and on the virtual platform. Ladies and gentlemen, I request you to rise for the national anthem. <laughs>